<laughs> All right, so I'm just going to start with J2 kind of chords and uh, senior one chords. So we have E minor, we have A minor, F major seven, I think, uh, G, uh, maybe a D, that's senior one. Cool. So we've got the, these kind of chords. Um, when I'm practicing them, first off, I have uh, I have a three-step rule. Uh, one kind of goes into uh, kind of different ways of fretting, but um, I always um, I always kind of when I'm forming my chord, I always want to make sure I've got two bends, one in each joint of my finger. Yeah. Um, this means that my fingers are coming up and on top of the fret like that, on top of the string. So I really so the, imagine that's my my string. My finger is directly on top of it. Yeah, so it requires very little effort because we're using pressure and kind of angles to really, really, um, thanks, Vicky, uh, really, really make sure that this is comfortable and we don't have to apply too much pressure. And so if you kind of have your fingers coming down at an angle, you're actually pushing that way rather than pushing the string into the fretboard and you have to push a lot harder. And when you push harder, that's how you get injured as a, as a player, yeah? So the other thing, I think about when I'm fretting a note. So again, this applies to J1. Um, I always want to make sure my finger is as close to the bottom of the fret as possible without actually touching it. So, um, cause it's much, much easier to push down here and get a very clear sound. But if we're on top of the metal, it's not very nice. So for an example, I'm gonna play the first fret here. Um, I'm not applying a lot of pressure. I'm not grabbing it with my thumb or anything. I'm just directly on top of it. But if I do the same amount of pressure at the top, nothing so um it's a good kind of principle to go by yeah so that's the first thing of fretting the chord um there are a couple of other bits but we'll try and round it all together so uh again using the fingers uh the finger markings that are in your books those are going to be quite appropriate ones um however i would recommend learning your chords in a couple of different ways if possible for example this e minor chord i play it with fingers one and two I'd also play with fingers two and three. And this, this is to do with chord changing. So I've got three step method when I'm changing chords. Um, it's when we form our chords, um, we, we don't just play them one at a time. They're always part of a chord progression that we're trying to put together and make work. Um, so we need really need to focus on how to get from here to a different chord rather than cool, uh, hand off, hand on, hand off, hand on. So. Step one, I always look for what I call a common finger. Yeah, so this is a finger that is in the, on the same fret, on the same string, in, in the chord that you're playing and the chord that you're transitioning to, yeah? So for example, if I'm playing, um, I don't know, an, a C chord, going to an A minor chord, um, we have two common fingers. We have our first finger and our second finger, because those are both in the same place both chords yeah so it might be a little tricky to kind of use them both but even if you just use your first finger um as a common finger that's absolutely fine too um the reason this is really really useful um is because we don't actually have to take all of our fingers off the fretboard and we've kind of kind of anchored in it really really helps our transitions yeah so another example e minor going to a minor that second finger if we're fretting it with fingers one and two uh, it's a common finger, yeah, and it really helps that transition. Cool. The next thing I look for, um, to be honest, I prefer this to uh, common fingers. That's such a weird, weird thing to say, a common finger, uh, which is what I call moving in pairs, which will take a little bit of practice, but once we get there, it will make our lives very, very easy. Yeah. So, for example, you junior two kids. Um, if I've got this C chord, going to an F major seven chord, um, these two fingers are moving in what we call a pair. Yeah? So they're a string and a fret apart. And in the C chord and in the F major seven chord, they're a string and a fret apart. Yeah? So what I can do there, I can kind of lock them. I can lift them up together and I can put them back down together. So it's one movement. I'm not walking them over. I'm moving them up together and down together. Yeah. And this chord is particularly cool because we also have a common finger. So we have a common finger here and a movement in pairs, which I think is a, a movement 
as a pair. That's better. That's better words. Better words, Jimmy. You got this. Cool. So that um, that is a movement in, in uh, a movement of pairs. Uh, another kind of few different movements of pairs that you might not have thought about. For me, uh, this C chord going to a D major chord. Yeah. So these two fingers, a string and a fret apart here in the D chord. Yeah. So I lift them up together. Obviously, it's a big jump. They come back down together, so I'm not moving things over one at a time. Yeah, so it's a really, really, really useful movement. Yeah, cool. And then there are more examples of that. And then uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. the last thing, if there's no common kind of fingers whatsoever, there's nothing that you can move as a pair. I would basically fret the chord from the lowest possible point. So, for example, if I'm going from C to G, um, small G, not big G, uh, in this. I have to take everything off together and then do a complete swap. Yeah, so I've got these two now. So these are the two that I'm aiming to get down. So if I can get these down, uh, kind of one there. So if you're struggling with this movement, for me, getting these two across, that's my priority. The reason being, if you look at your books, um, uh, everything up to the B string, um, I've got these two fingers on are actually within the chord so you've got a little bit of time to drop this one down because you can actually perform the chord on beat one rather than you know if you get that one down first you, you, you'll have to miss the beat or strum, strum that which doesn't sound like a G yeah so you can add it on afterwards yeah so it's a really kind of great rule of thumb um, and then the other thing I guess not really part of my checklist, but something I like to do is really analyze what the key or the core movement of the um, the changes. So for me, it's this kind of twist motion, but I would not have got that if I wasn't really aiming for those two to move across, but just even just going from these two just to there and practicing that will really help with, with that transition. Cool. So the other thing, oh, there's too many other things here, but I did mention this earlier and I said I'd circle back to it. Um, about fretting chords differently depending on what you're going to. Uh, so uh, I had an example of this in J4. No, we're going to use a J1, J2, sorry. So uh, this E minor chord, for example, it's really kind of easy to go to an A minor or a C because we've got those, we've got that as a common finger. However, if I'm going, um, actually, no. I lie. I actually play like that because I prefer movement in pairs. Um, anyway, uh, so that for me is a is a much easier movement to do personally. However, when I've got these two down, uh, I find it way easier to go to a G chord because we've got this first finger is a common finger now. Um, and there's a few different examples of this. Um, so if I'm playing my E minor chord like this, uh, I think it's quite easy uh, to go to an A chord, for example, or an E major. I know that's J3, old and senior two, but that's a very, very easy movement. However, if we're going to a D chord, if we bring these two across, it's almost a movement in pairs, and it's much easier than having to transition everything all the way around yeah so those are kind of a few key tips on changing chord i hope that kind of helps with some things um but again if you've got a particular chord progression that you're struggling with let me know um i'd be more than happy to break it down and work out what the kind of key movements that you need are um, and then the other thing is how you practice them and for me practice them with a metronome so i'd stick my metronome on um I'm using my phone to kind of check that I'm still alive on, on the Facebook, but um, I would literally work in quarter notes. So say I've got a three chord chord progression. So let's take something like and a G, D and C, why not? Um, I'd put my metronome on and I'd play them all as um, whole notes. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, and just keep rotating them, yeah, four, one, two, three, four, 
and then I would basically do this until I'm very comfortable and then I'd add in a strum each time so one two three four one two three four one two three four and then three strums one, two three four until we can change on every beat one two three four one two three four one two three four yeah until um, so at this point, I would keep my metronome the same, and then I would change chord every two beats. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and really get used to that because that's a weird kind of motion to get used to until we get to the point we can change our chord on every beat. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. I should have chosen a four chord chord progression. That would have made way more sense. Um, but again, this is also a great way to learn songs as well. So if you get a chord sheet up for a song that you're learning, um, if you can look at all the chords and play them one per beat, you will really, really get to grips with what chords that you have coming up and what chords that you have, um, you know, kind of next in the song. And it's a great way of learning stuff. And you practice all your transitions in the right order that, in that way as well. You just need to go back and work them out. Uh, when, how long each one lasts for. If anyone wants to know how I kind of get things up to uh, a standard that I'm happy with, I will tell you that real quick before I finish as a final last, last little bit. Um, so whether it's a scale, whether it's a chord, a chord progression, I would stick my metronome on really, really slow. Um, I like to practice things slowly because I don't think if you, if you can play it slowly, you can play it quickly you know, if you speed it up gradually. But if you can't play it slowly, there's no way you can play it quickly. So start slow. Um, a big thing I found is people just want to try and play as fast as they can. And it's not very neat. It's not very accurate. And But really starting slow and getting that kind of the build up there would be really, really kind of useful. So um, when that being said, when I get something to a point that I'm happy with playing it at 40, you know, I'll make sure I can play it at slow speed 40 then maybe a medium speed like 80 kind of fastish pace 120 or 100 to 120 and then a very fast thing like kind of up to 150 depending on what it is um, so I take it through four speeds and then once I'm happy with that I'll pick one and I will run it 20 times and if I make a mistake I will start again I need to I'll make sure that I can play it 20 times without making a mistake and once I get to that point um, again, this is, I guess, for maybe more of your, your advanced players out there. Um, afterwards, if I've done that, I would then try, um, I've got a few different things. If it's a scale, I will be like, cool, I'm going to put an accent on this particular beat, on beat three every time and do it another few times. But if it's something I want to play to a very high standard, I want it to be so automatic that um, I can get a buck up open and I can read a paragraph whilst playing something to a metronome. And once you can do that, you've got the tick in the bag. Let's put it like that.